This week on the Green Left News podcast, Palestine solidarity encampments pop up at universities in the US, Australia and around the world, thousands march to end violence against women, and the Freedom Flotilla planning to deliver aid directly to Gaza. As always, this podcast was recorded on stolen land. I'm recording to you here from the land of the Wadjuk Noongar people. Green Left is committed to supporting the struggles for First Nation justice always. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellist. I'm recording on Gadigal land here in Sydney, and I'm excited to bring you all the latest news this week. I'm joined again by Riley from Borloo, Perth. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, Isaac, and friends and comrades. Um, here again with better sound this time. Sorry about that last week. Yeah, so it's uh, we've got quite a lot of news to get through this week, so I'll kick it off with... Um, what's been one of the more exciting developments in the last few weeks. So even as Israel is continuing to threaten its ground invasion of Rafah, which is where more than a million people are sheltering from uh, Israel's genocidal assault on Gaza, students around the world have pitched tents at campuses to protest their university's complicity in the genocide. So the first uh, student encampment was set up at Columbia University in the United States uh, around April 17. And it quickly spread across the country to more than 50 campuses. And students are calling on their universities to divest from weapons manufacturers and other companies that are supporting Israel's genocide. Now, in response, the police have uh, attacked the encampments, arresting hundreds of students and sparking community outrage and protests. Even last night, a Zionist kind of gang attacked one of the campuses and police didn't do anything to protect the students who were getting you know, bashed and their tents and things destroyed. Um, so to show solidarity both with students in the US and to force their own universities to cut ties with genocidal Israel and also just to show solidarity with uh, the people of Gaza, encampments have been set up all around the world on actually on every continent. Um, so here in Australia, the first uh, was set up at the University of Sydney on April 22, followed quickly by University of Melbourne, University of Queensland, ANU, Monash, and Curtin University. And Green Left spoke to students at the Uni Melbourne encampment. Hi, we're students at the University of Melbourne. Um, we're here at the encampment to show our solidarity with Gaza. Now we're here at Melbourne Uni camping out in solidarity with the Palestinian people and in protest of Melbourne Uni's ties to apartheid Israel. We know that all universities in Gaza have been destroyed um, in what has now starting to be called the scholasticide. Appallingly, the University of Melbourne has financial relationships and educational relationships with some of the companies involved in this bloodshed, uh, like Lockheed Martin, BAE Systems, Rosebank, Boeing, just name a few, there's a lot more, um, but that's why we're here. Now, I was lucky to speak to uh, some US students and socialists who were involved in the encampments at Berkeley, uh, the City University of New York and San Francisco University. Uh, so that was just before we started recording this podcast. And you can listen to that interview on the podcast feed or watch the video at greenleft.org.au. We're here because this university, like countless others across the world, has overwhelming ties with arms manufacturers and Israeli institutions and continue to promote these ties and programs with the genocidal and apartheid state of Israel. Our university invites Israeli institutions who support the ongoing war crimes onto our own university grounds. They're afraid of what students are capable of. They've seen the protests in Columbia University, in Yale University, in Harvard University, and have seen the mass outpouring of support amongst the student population to come out and stand with the student activists getting repressed. And I think our university is scared that thousands of students will come by if they dare touch our encampment. It's disclosed, divest. We will not stop, we will not rest. Disclosed, divest. We will not stop, we will not rest. Disclosed. Now I've been down to the UC encampment, which is close by. Uh, And it's inspiring to see students who are taking action to end their university support for genocidal apartheid Israel, especially, you know, in the context of Israel destroying all the universities in Gaza. Um, Now, Riley, you're kind of uh, 
close to Curtin University or used to study there, I think that's right. Um, what's yeah, was, what's um, kind of the vibe down there? Yeah, so I was actually a, a student for, a perennial student for 10 years and a staff member at one point. Um, before I talk about Curtin, I actually want to point out, you, when you say um, uh, uh, there was, there's been cancer on every continent, every continent, including Antarctica, I saw a picture recently of a, um, a solidarity camp at a research station in Antarctica, so that's um, bloody fantastic. Um, so, yeah, the um, Curtin encampment was launched yesterday with a rally. Uh, I wasn't able to stick around too long, but um, there was a fantastic turnout despite the the heavy rain. Everyone was there in solidarity, including many um, many people from the broader left, not just students. Uh, a lot of people have already pitched their ten tents. I don't have a lot of information about how it's going just yet because it's only just started, but um, there should be more coming soon. The rally was really good. Um, as I say, great turnout. Uh, student, uh, Students of Palestine, WA, organised it in coordination with the Student Guild of Curtin. And um, they had speakers from various groups, including Friends of Palestine, WA, um, Jews for Palestine, and a few others. Yeah, and um, kind of as we've recording, I mean, uh, last night, um, the encampment at Monash University was actually attacked by Zionists, so obviously emboldened by the attacks in the US um, and about 20 Zionists kind of went into the camp in the middle of the night and, you know, destroyed some tents and intimidated people. Um, and I think there's similar uh, threats happening at, at other encampments of Zionists coming in and, and harassing people or just disturbing the encampments. And I know here in Sydney um, tomorrow there's a we're holding a bit of a rally because there's a, going to be a Zionist kind of counter protest happening. So we're all coming out in numbers to defend the encampment. So I think this is probably something that's going to be developed over the next um, few weeks and we can report more about on the next uh, episode of the podcast. Um, but it's important to, you know, if you're, if you live near one of these uh, universities that are taking action, go down and support the encampments, um, show your solidarity, stick around for a few hours, camp out if, if you're able um, it's really important that we keep them going until we can, you know, cut the ties with Israel at the, from the universities and obviously end the genocide in Gaza. The student encampments were also hailed by speakers at the weekend. Palestine rallies. I know in Gadigal, Sydney, on April 28, thousands rallied to march uh, to mark more than 200 days since Israel launched its latest genocidal attack. And with the death toll in Gaza estimated to be more than 40,000 uh, people, protesters have called out Australia's ongoing complicity in the genocide. So the rally here in Gadigal land was addressed by Professor Mazin Kumsia, who's a Bethlehem-based Palestinian environmental justice activist and director of the Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability. And he's currently on a speaking tour of Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you, to all of you. Peace, peace means with justice, as Martin Luther King said. Peace means that we have to work for it. It's not going to be given to us. Freedom is never handed on a silver platter to us. And when I look at your faces, diverse faces, that gives me hope. Because we saw who are the enemy. The enemy are a minority, a tiny minority that control this world. And that profit, profit from like the deals between the military of Australia and Israel providing weapons for genocide. You can watch the full speech on the Green Left website. And we've also got, a, we just had an interview recorded with Professor Mazin today, so that should be online shortly as well. More than 10,000 people joined the rally in Nam, Melbourne on April 28th, which included speakers from the Maritime Union of Australia, the Loud Jew Collective, and Australia Asia Worker Links. In Bulu, Perth, the April 27 rally demanded the Labor end its complicity in the genocide and imposed an immediate arms embargo on Israel, as well as calling on the government to expel the Israel, Israeli ambassador. After the speeches, protesters marched through the city, stopping twice to stage die-ins to commemorate the Al-Shifa hospital massacres and the flower massacre. 
In Corner Yurta or Adelaide, activists staged a die-in at Rundle Mall on April 28, with organisers saying that Israel can no longer hide its atrocities from the world. Speakers spoke about the mass graves that were found in hospitals in the Gaza Strip, containing 700 bodies of women, children and elderly Palestinians who were tortured and executed by the IDF. And here in uh, Bulu, Perth, Union of Palestine WA organised its fourth community picket against Israel's Zim shipping company at the Walaya Fremantle port at Patrick's Terminal on April 28th. Uh, police attempted to intimidate the picket by targeting marshals, including myself, uh, and organisers first, as well as um, as well as the legal observers, which notably is a protected uh, class of person under national law. They targeted all the org- key organisers, really. Um, the protesters weren't deterred. In fact, uh, many people were... I saw many new faces there, actually, and a lot of people were very quite proudly defiant in the face of the police. Uh, almost everyone got moved on notices, but the police were basically forced to give them out one at a time and were able to hold up work uh, for probably about at least half an hour. Uh, the police were definitely more uh, more proactive than they have been in the past. And uh, we're seeing that all across the country, really, with the police just getting getting fed up and having a lot of political pressure put on them to to cut down these, these pickets and these protests. Uh, but it was really fantastic to see all these great new activists who uh, left the picket holding their move on notices high in the air, proud, and awesome. uh, many of them uh, keen to to keep doing this because you know no matter if if one particular action is you know holds up work for twenty minutes, thirty minutes, two hours, every single one is a success, success, and every single one builds the movement. 100%. And I believe there is going to be a national day of action of port uh, rallies at ports on uh, May 25. Um, so check the Green Left calendar for the details of the ones in your city. There was also a protest in Bankstown in uh, southwest Sydney on April 13 outside Quick Step Holdings, which manufactures parts for the F-35 fighter jets used to bomb Gaza. So hundreds of people attended, including from the local Palestinian, Lebanese and Arab communities. And it was also supported by socialist groups, trade union representatives, students and the anti-Zionist Jews against the occupation group. And speakers asked the federal government to come clean on how many how many companies are selling weapons to Israel. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute has released data showing that global military spending has risen for the ninth year in a row to a total of $2.4 trillion dollars. The US accounts for 37% of this spending, about $916 billion, by far the biggest spending. NATO countries combined spent, and I've got a double look at this, $1,341 billion, so that's $1.341 trillion, or 55% of the total. That's huge. Uh, Green Senator David Hubridge alongside anti-war activists, said the amount spent is quote-unquote obscene, and I 100% agree with that. Pip Hinman, representing the Sydney Anti-Orcus Coalition and Sydney Stop the War Coalition, said that Australia is spending more on military than it does on education as part of a bipartisan approach to the US military presence in Southeast Asia. She said, quote, A government which truly had our interests at heart would allocate our taxes to help ease the cost of living crisis and fix our broken public health, housing and affordability and welfare. Shoebridge pointed out that Australia spends more on weapons than Brazil, Canada and Spain and spends nearly twice as much per capita than Russia. And I've done my own back of the envelope calculations on this. We spend five times more per capita than China does. So, you know, we've got all the, the... media banging on about how much China is a threat, how we've got to defend ourselves against China. And here we are spending five times more per capita on military than they are for a much smaller country. Like it's 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 insane. Um and notably also we spend more overall than Israel uh on military, although not although Israel actually tops the world per capita in military spending, which is unsurprising considering they're conducting a genocide. Uh, this money would be would absolutely be better spent on the urgent climate transition, the cost of living crisis and building public housing, not more wars. Yeah, it's in, insane numbers. And it's also worth looking at what the, you know, the weapons that we're making here in Australia are being 
uh, used for. So a human rights watch report from August detailed the mass killing of hundreds or potentially even thousands of unarmed migrants and asylum seekers by Saudi Arabia at the uh, Yemen-Saudi border between March 2022 and June 2023. So the majority of these people were Ethiopians who were fleeing serious human rights abuses, with an increasing proportion of them uh, women and girls. And the Human Rights Watch report described sickening torture, murder and armed violence against unarmed civilians using a variety of weapons. And some freedom of information figures that were obtained by Green Left show that the weapons used to massacre these unarmed civilians were likely sold to Saudi Arabia by Australia. So from July 2015 to January 2024, the Department of Defense approved 131 weapons export permits to Saudi Arabia and 257 to the United Arab Emirates, which is 388 in total. And so one of the weapons that was highlighted in the HRW report is a mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicle, which is like an armored car type thing. And the report contained a satellite image of one of these cars on the near the border guard post, and the vehicle's fitted with a heavy machine gun turret on the top of its roof. So the mechanism that's actually used to connect the, the machine gun on the on the roof to the to the, the vehicle itself is actually manufactured by Australians Australian weapons manufacturer Electro Optic Systems, which was awarded a huge contract by Saudi Arabia in early 2019. Uh, the contract was to supply it with 500 remote weapon systems. So it raises serious questions about whether Australia produced weapons and parts that are being used to commit human rights abuses, just as like uh, Australian companies are producing parts for the F-35s that are obviously committing, uh, helping commit the genocide in Gaza. So it's urgent that Australia's weapons exports are subject to a transparent investigation and that we immediately end the sales of, of weapons and components in particular to countries that are committing human rights abuses. Yeah, that's all of our tax dollars at work there, killing people all over the world. Uh, that's absolutely disgusting. Yeah, and it's worth noting that uh, you know Australia and the, the Australian government and Penny Wong in particular keeps banging on that no, 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 we don't, we don't export arms to Israel, we don't export these weapons, and it's it's a, it's a very sneaky lie because it, it's it's technically true. We don't export finished weapons, you know, bombs or anything like that. We we export little parts that get assembled elsewhere, but we are no less complicit for it. And it's it's just such a, a disgusting little way of hiding that. And on that, the Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister Richard Miles has committed hundreds of billions in public funding over the next decade to manufacture even more lethal weapons. Labor is lifting defence spending from just under 2% of GDP to 2.4 by 2023, 20, sorry, 2033 to 34. Uh, now, the only time it has been that high in history was during the Korean War when it reached 2.5%. Mars told the National Press Club that Labor's historical mission is about building a, quote, in, an integra integrated defence force capacity, which really means we're just tightly binding ourselves with US imperialism. The plan to spend more than $330 billion over the next decade means leaning more heavily into AUKUS partners, Britain and the United States. He said Australia needs to protect its interests in the Pacific and blamed China for creating competition for security partnerships. His second justification for the increase in spending was to support national security and prosperity based on global, a global rules-based order, which is just, that's, sorry for my language, but that's fucking laughable considering what we're supporting in Israel. You know, where's the rules-based order there? I mean, we've all heard that before, but it's just worth saying every bloody time. <laughs> It's only a rules-based order when it when it suits us. The announcement puts the priorities of the Labor government on full display. Just war drive, war drive. That's all all they want. More imperialism. Tens of thousands joined mass rallies to demand real action to combat male violence against women over April 26 and 27. It was promoted by the killing of more than 27 women so far this year. The initiative was led by a, a community organization called What Were You Wearing, which is a, an organization by survivors for survivors uh, fighting to end sexual violence. 
So protesters in capital cities and regional towns across Australia demanded this national emergency be treated as one. As 15 women have been murdered in the month of April alone, which is double the rate of this time last year. Now, What Were You Wearing is calling for changes, including ensuring that police, media and first responders undertake mandatory victim blaming prevention training, giving victim survivors access to alternative reporting options, including specialist courts, um, delaying media from identifying victims of violence for 48 hours until families have been notified, and boosting federal funding for victim survivor organisations with a minimum of five-year commitments. Now, Albanese uh, attended the march in Canberra, and you might have seen he sparked a bit of controversy by complaining that he uh, had been told he couldn't speak, which the organiser Sarah Williams had said said was a lie. Um, so it was, uh, it was pretty uh, blatant that Albanese was just there for a bit of a photo shoot and to show that he's uh, a great leader, but in reality he's not doing nearly enough to combat um, you know, the urgent kind of need for immediate action to stop men killing women and ending domestic violence. So there has been, there was a national cabinet meeting and they've put forward um, this plan, uh, which you can read more about in Green Left, but uh, pretty much to sum it up, it's it's not doing enough. It's actually going with a, uh, a, a coalition uh, created plan to combat um, domestic violence. Um, so they ha- they've taken some steps but as usual with labor they haven't uh, gone far enough so we'll see where this uh, momentum for this campaign can go it's a, a real national kind of emergency that's going on for for almost a decade activists have been campaigned for west australian labor to amend the laws governing gender reassignment uh queer liberation baloo has been organizing action since last september calling on Labor to follow through on its promises to the queer community, including gender recognition and anti-discrimination reforms. Many non-government organisations, in particular Rainbow Futures WA, as well as Transfoco WA, have been lobbying Premier Roger Cook for change, um, but the, the grassroots approach uh, but the grassroots approach has, has uh, worked really well. On April 17, Labor introduced the Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Amendment, Sex or Gender Changes Bill 2024. If passed, the bill would repeal the Gender Reassignment Act 2000 and the Gender Reassignment Regulations 2001 and mean a person only has to submit an application for a gender recognition with supporting evidence from a doctor or psychologist, which is still, you know, not the best, but it's it's certainly better than where it was. Um, the bill falls short of what LGBT TIQ organisations have called for around medical evidence, the removal of sex and gender from identity documentation altogether. I mean, you know, why why do we even have that on a birth certificate? It doesn't really make sense. Uh, and the inclusion of intersex inter- indeterminate categories and other labour promises, including outlawing conversion therapy practices and reforming the anti-discrimination law. And it, it's worth noting that um, while this is still a pretty good reform for the trans community, it does so at the absolute expense of the intersex community. It, uh, as I said before, it, it introduces, for no apparent reason, the inclusion of an intersex indeterminate category on the birth certificate, which is something that is contradictory to the Darlington Statement, which is a statement, a collective statement by the intersex community on what they want, basically, and how they want to be treated. Uh, and the the definitive attitude on that on that statement is that uh, they don't want uh, an intersex category because it means that they will be medicalized from birth. Uh, so in a way, this is it's really it's one step forward for for the trans community, but it's one step back for the intersex community, and it it's created a bit bit of a um, a problem where you know no, nobody wants to sell out sell out somebody else's rights for their own. Uh, and in addition, John Quigley, who's the Attorney General of WA, appeared on a community radio station just after this reform was announced. Uh, and when when uh, asked to discuss conversion practices in WA, the first thing he said, the first thing was, I've been subject to conversion practices when I went from being a lawyer to a politician. And that is just an indication of the the absolute cluelessness and brain deadness of this guy 
and the Labour Party in general that he would say something so fuckheaded as that. I mean, to, to compare to compare a, a voluntary career transition to the ab abhorrent treatment that people receive under conversion practices is just <laughs> disgusting. In, in response to this, uh, and in response to the the problems of this legislation in general, uh, various members of the queer community staged a sit-in at John Quigley's office last week. What do we do? We're under attack. Stand up, fight back. What do we do? We're under attack. Stand up, fight back. What do we do? We're under attack. Stand up, fight back. What do we do? We're under attack. Stand up. So on May one, thousands of unionists marched to mark May Day, which is the International Day of Workers' Struggle, a chance of union power. And the workers united will never be defeated, rung out across the streets. Now, in Gadigal or Sydney, CFMEU New South Wales Secretary Darren Greenfield told the rally that employers need to know if you kill a worker, you should go to jail. He said New South Wales is the only state not to have industrial manslaughter laws and that uh, we demand the state government bring them in now. So there was representatives of heaps of unions at the rally, including Electrical Trade Union, uh, New South Wales Plumbers Union, United Workers Union, Maritime Union of Australia and others. And there was a huge contingent of CFMEU workers. Um, the, the rally here in Sydney had a strong Palestine solidarity contingent, uh, including having Palestinian activist uh, Jana Fayed uh, address the rally and ask the unions to do more to support Palestine. Uh, there's also a young doctor who spoke about the impossible workloads and understaffing in hospitals and linked it to the hospital massacres in Gaza. A union and a government that does not care about doctors uncovering mass graves in Gaza does not care about us missing our lunch breaks and having poor pay rates. So there are doctors, patients being buried in mass graves in Gaza and the list goes on. They don't even have water. They do not have oxygen and electricity. So a government that does not care about that does not care about us. So free, free. Free, free. Free, free. free. Now, there are also May Day actions happening this weekend, including, uh, I believe, in Borloo, Perth, and out in Western Sydney, so we can report a bit more on those actions on the next episode of the podcast. Uh, the right-wing media have accused climate action group Disrupt Borough Pub of weaponising children following a protest at oil and gas company Woodside's annual general meeting on April 17. The West Australian said a disruption of the AGM by two young people and a young mother in which they called out Woodside Chair Richard Goida and CEO Meg O'Neill's children to highlight the enormous costs of climate disruption on future generations was unfair. The West Australian has a history of painting Woodside as a victim of climate protesters and following a protest at O'Neill's house last year, cl they claimed that climate activist Matilda Lane Rose had been groomed by another activist, a claim that was easily disproved. Um, I know Tilda personally, and she's a very bright, very passionate activist who, you know, she doesn't need to be convinced or groomed that there's a, a disaster on, you know, she knows what she's doing. This is a classic example of establishment media robbing young people of their autonomy and political choices, claiming that youth are being corrupted by activists. Young people are the victims of today's fossil capitalism, and they have every right to voice their opposition to massive fossil fuel projects such as Woodside's browse basin expansion. Uh, so Roger Cook was actually asked about the the incident at a press conference last Friday, and he claimed that the, the activists had engaged in a despicable act and had threatened the um, petroleum executives and their families. And now keep in mind that the the children are the children of the of Meg O'Neill are about thirty, and the children of the other guys are probably about forty. You know, these aren't children in the in the literal sense. The activists have actually responded by uh, threatening to to take legal action for defamation, uh, <laughs> including. Uh, so they're not currently seeking damages, but according to the notice, uh, they they want a written apology, which is fair enough, a retraction, and a reimbursement of reasonable legal costs currently amounting to one dollars, which is a very <laughs> funny deal. Yeah, that's great. Uh, all props to the uh, the young people who are taking action. You know to stop the kind of massive fossil fuel projects that are kind of destroying their future and all of our futures, but also props to them for standing up to the, the right-wing media as well. It's always good to see. Um, yeah, and the more, the more you piss, piss off the right-wing media, the more you know you're doing something right. Exactly, exactly. So in a, in a win for independent media like us at Green Left, 
Uh, activist Stephen Langford petitioned the Katoomba Library in the Blue Mountains to take out a subscription to Green Left. So he noticed that the library stocked like most of the other corporate papers but didn't have Green Left. And so he uh, got a petition ready and got 120 people to sign it um, for Green Left to be made available in the library. He even got Blue Mountains Mayor Mark Greenhill um, to sign it and he told Green uh, he told Stephen that he reads the paper. So then a few days later on April 23, uh, the library uh, announced that it had decided to stock Green Left. So if you want to help uh, support independent media and keep you know keep this podcast and the, all the other work that we do going, uh, become a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. It's only five or ten dollars a month. You know the price of you know two coffees or one beer. It's uh, not too much, and you can help keep this people powered project going. So sign up today. And if you want to go the extra mile, you could go to your local library and convince them to stock Green Left. I think that's a very creative yeah, very true. idea. Um, and we're getting closer to the Eco Socialism 2024 conference here in Bully, Perth. It's going to be taking place on June 28th to 30th and will feature left wing activists from every inhabited continent on the earth, excluding Antarctica, I believe. Might be wrong. Um, the latest edition is Mariana Riscali from Brazil's largest radical left party, the Socialist and Freedom Party, or PSOL. Riscali is on the PSOL National Executive and is an executive director of its research and education centre. She is also a leader of the Socialist Left Movement, a revolutionary tendency within the PSOL. Yeah, and uh, Riscali joins a great list of speakers from all the other continents. Yeah, you're right, it's excluding Antarctica. Uh, the biggest contingent is coming from Asia, so that's including speakers from the Philippines, Pakistan, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Palestine, as well as speakers uh, from South Africa, Ireland, and the United States. We've also got some great uh, local speakers, including First Nations leader Megan Cracker, Australian Palestine Advocacy Network President Nasser Mashni, and Zach Schofield from Rising Tide. Plus, there'll be heaps more, including uh, Green Left editorial members, Socialist Alliance leaders, and local queer rights and climate activists. So definitely head to ecosocialism.org.au for the full list of speakers, the full agenda, and to book tickets and register us. It's going to be a really incredible conference, and we will hope to see you all there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing people there. And um, notably, our, our biggest speaker probably is actually Leila Khalid, from the PLFP, in, uh, so revolutionary icon from Palestine. So that's going to be uh, fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get her into the country because she's been denied a visa. Uh, you know, government's happy to let in war criminals like Doran Olmog, but not so much people who have actually served a jail sentence already and are an elected member of a uh, parliament. Yes, and uh, p- people who've been listening to the podcast for a while will have heard about the campaign to let Leila Khaled speak. Um, and also the attempts to, to you know, st- not just stop her from entering the country, but also stop her from even appearing on a, a video call via Zoom or, or whatever video uh, software. So there's a huge campaign to shut down Palestinian voices, and Green Left is doing our best to uh, fight back against that. So, yeah, check out uh, our coverage in Green Left of you know, the campaign to let uh, Leila Khalid speak and also head to ecosocialism.org.au to get your tickets and find out more about the conference. Freedom Flotilla Coalition said on April 27 that its mission to deliver urgent aid to Gaza was facing obstacles, but but that it's determined to push ahead. The flotilla comprises human rights activists, lawyers, doctors, nurses, parliamentarians and politicians who are aiming to deliver desperately needed life-saving aid to the besieged people of Gaza, challenging Israel's control over the entry of humanitarian aid. Organisers told a media conference that the Guinea-Bissau International Ships Registry requested an inspection of its lead ship, the Akdenes, on April 25 which was an unusual, an unusual request given that it had passed all required inspections. Then, Guinea-Bissau removed its flag from two of the flotilla ships, which pretty much means that the ships can't sail because they need, they need a national flag. 
Flotilla organizers said that the highly unusual requests and the flags being taken down show that uh, Guinea-Bissau had become complicit in Israel's deliberate starvation, illegal siege and genocide of Palestinians in Gaza, and organizers are confident they will find a solution, announcing on April 27, we will sail. So there's three Australians, Surya McEwen, Helen O'Sullivan and Daniel Coward, a part of the flotilla, and the New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties has called on the Australian government to do everything in its power to ensure that the, the flotilla is safe, particularly as in 2014, Israeli forces sieged and raided the flotilla. Um, they actually executed nine passengers and injured dozens more. So definitely head to freedomflotilla.org to find out more about the, uh, the campaign and uh, support it by making a donation. And uh, last week we reported on the A15 International Day of Action and the myriad of protests, pickets and disruptive actions that took place across the country. There were also a number of actions that took place in Canada, as reported by Green Left Canada's correspondent, Jeff Shantz. Activists across Canada heeded the call with blockades, pickets and other direct actions against major economic infrastructure and were met with severe ramping up of police repression, with dozens of people arrested in several cities. 21 people were arrested in Halifax as they blocked the road leading to the port in a mass economic disruption. In Montreal, 45 people were arrested after a bank sit-in. More than 100 people held a people's picket for Palestine in Vancouver, blocking the entrance to Delta Port, the country's largest container terminal. The action was impactful and costly, with the global container terminals company that operates Delta Port telling local media that the protests impacted several operations. In Toronto, dozens entered the office of AWZ Ventures, which funds tech companies that work with the IDF. The next day, activists blocked a major rail line in the city's west end, with more than 100 people blocking the tracks for at least five hours. Five people were arrested and riot police on horses were deployed to push people off the tracks. The actions in Canada were effective in heeding the A15 call for economic disruption, and many important tactical and strategic lessons will have been learned by the activists involved, as they have been here and presumably all over the world. Yeah, it's great to see that the, those international days of action, you know, you hear about the things that are happening locally, but it's great to hear about what's happening in other countries. Um, speaking of other countries, the Volkswagen factory in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is in the U.S., was previously the only VW facility in the world that didn't have union representation. But on April 20, workers voted in favour of unionisation in a three-day ballot. 73% of workers voted to be represented by the United Auto Workers Union, or the UAW. And UAW organiser Victor Vaughan told supporters after the results were announced, we now have a voice and we're eager to sit down and negotiate a contract. The previous attempts to unionize the VW facility had failed, but things turned around after the significant UAW victories at Ford, General Motors and Stellantis last year, where workers won big improvements in contract negotiations after taking historic strike action. The US has reimposed sanctions on Venezuela's oil and gas industry as part of its long-term strategy to strangle the Venezuelan economy and cause an overthrow of the left government led by Nicolas Maduro. The sanctions have been eased for a six-month period starting in October last year, but the period expired on April 17th. Companies were given a 45-day period to wind down their activities in Venezuela. Those wishing to continue dealing with Venezuela's oil sector after May 31 will have to apply for licenses that will be considered on a case-by-case basis, according to the US Treasury. The sanctions amount to an economic blockade and prevent US companies from having any dealings with Venezuelan government bodies, such as the state-owned oil company PDVSA. Non-US companies can also be targeted with secondary sanctions, preventing the Venezuelan government from trading with the outside world, basically cutting them off from contact the same way the US did to Cuba. The blockade has caused severe hardship to the people. There are are shortages of medicines, vaccines and medical equipment, and electricity and water supply have been impacted. The sanctions have been ramped up ahead of the July 28th elections. Now, you know, Venezuela is one of these countries that um, particularly liberals, particularly in the US, love to point out and say, oh, this is what socialism is. This is, is this what you want? Well, you know, you, you, you look at why it's the US itself that strangles them and prevents them from succeeding. Yeah, 100%. And they want to, you know, cause, uh, you know, all these problems in the country so that they can force kind of uh, political change and force, you know, governments that are a bit more US friendly to take over. 
Um, and they've, you know, it's pretty transparent how often this has been done throughout history as well. So, for, the, for those not familiar with the history of it, I mean, I'd, I'd recommend looking up Operation Condor and learning about just what America has done in Latin America. I mean, it's just mind bogglingly evil and uh, it's still going. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's a lot of good, good uh, things to read about that. Now, there's also been elections that have just taken place in the Spanish uh, Basque country or Euskadi for its 75-seat regional parliament. According to Green Left's European correspondent Dick Nichols, while not much seems to have changed on the surface, there are key differences that will change the trajectory of politics in the region. So the Basque Nationalist Party, or PNV, will still form government, and the Left Nationalist Electoral Alliance, EH Bildu, will still be the main opposition force. Both groups currently have 27 seats, but the Socialist Party of Euskadi, which is the regional franchise of the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party, or PSOE, will continue to give support to the PNV, as will the local branch of the Conservative People's Party. So the PNV will still be in government. But these results do leave the incoming administration more exposed than ever to EH Bildu's initiatives on social issues and Basque national rights. So there was higher participation at this election than the previous one in 2020, with almost 100,000 more people voting. And the biggest rise in votes went to EH Bildu, who went from 27.8% of votes to 32.5%. Now, this was due to two main sources. It was mostly uh, it was most closely associated with Euskadi's ongoing social and national struggles and was seen to be offering conc- concretely credible solutions to the problems generating them. And young people tended to vote more for EH Bildu, and so did Basque speakers, meaning that the incoming PNV government will find it hard to make excuses not to confront the Spanish state over Basque independence. The campaign to free Russian anti-war dissident Boris Kargolitsky was highlighted by former British Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn in a speech at Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe on April 17. Now an independent MP, Corbyn argued that Russian anti-war political prisoners, quote, deserve our recognition and our support. He also spoke out in defence of Julian Assange, as well as former Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis and British Palestinian surgeon Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitar, who were targeted by the German government over their support for Palestine. He said, we have to stand up for the right of people in all societies to dissent from what their governments are doing. And right now, that's more true than than bloody ever because what our governments are doing is insane. Yeah, it's great to see, you know, at least some politicians are speaking out, um, uh, even though the majority seem to be staying quiet. Um, In other news, uh, April 15 marked a year since war broke out between General Abdel Fattah Burhan's Sudanese Arms Forces, or SAF, and Mohamed Hemeti Dagalo's militia, which is known as the Rapid Support Forces, or the RSF, sending Sudan into a spiralling social and humanitarian crisis affecting millions. Uh, now, Wilson Madit Kuek from the Sudanese Australian Advocacy Network told Green Left that the civil war is an impediment to the establishment of a civilian democratic rule that millions in Sudan yearn for. He said the Sudanese people tasted various kinds of indignity humiliation and horrific forms of violations, such as killing, displacement, rape, forced celebration, torture, plundering of private and public property, destruction and sabotage of public facilities. He said the war's primary goal was, and still is, to eliminate the glorious peaceful revolution of December 2018 and to kill all features of what the December revolutionary moment accomplished in five years, adding that the victim is always the Sudanese citizen. In total, 8.6 million people have been dispersed across all 18 states of Sudan and in two neighbouring countries, and Wilson called for a massive increase in international aid and to step up political pressure to end the conflict. You can read more about all the stories we talked about today, plus videos, detailed analysis, book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. Yeah, our latest album review roundup for April, which is put together by Matt Ward, included albums by Down Upright, Echo Astral, Pearl Jam, David Rovix and others. That comes out every month. We've also had recently got reviews of films like Eo Capitano and book reviews of the radical Jewish tradition, Ultra Processed People and Nikki Winmar from Bush Kid to AFL Legend. 
plus heaps others. So check out the cultural section on the Green Left website. While you've mentioned David Rovix, uh, he will be performing at the upcoming Eco-Socialism Conference that we mentioned earlier. So if if the brilliant list of speakers wasn't already incentive enough for you to book a ticket, you get a, a great show out of it too. Yeah, that's very exciting. Uh, if people have enjoyed this podcast, you can please consider becoming a Green Left supporter from $5 a month and donate to our fighting fund to help us continue reporting on workers' climate and social justice movements. So you can go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. And your support is really appreciated, especially at the moment when you know, there's huge uh, movements going on and you know we've seen the failures of the mainstream media, including the you know the more liberal media in reporting the truth about what's happening in Palestine and in the the movement internationally. Thanks to Sean Valenzuela for the music you heard in the podcast. You can find his work by going to at Little Archer Beats or clicking the link in the description. Please also remember to follow Green Left Online on social media for latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.